Father God, thank you so much that this little guy Jacob yeah. is healthy. Amen. Amen. I'm just so blessed to see that old face. Mm -hmm. And Lord God, we just thank you for oh, just the countless blessings, Lord, that we can't even count. And uh, thank you that Michelle's back safely. Thank you for the people that are here today. And we just uh, thank you, Lord, for all that you do and the blessings that you bestow upon us to be able to get together and fellowship and um, just learn more about you day by day. And thank you for the midweek studies that you've opened up here at Rock Valley. And, and we just thank you, Lord, for... Um, I just want to, <laughs> I want to think of things to thank you for, Lord, because I'm in the spirit of thanksgiving right now like I should be in prayer. And Lord, we just praise you and we just ask that you just bless this study and work uh, your mighty miracles through Chauncey and I, Lord, speak through us. And Lord, let it not be our words that come out today. Let it be only you, Lord God, your wisdom that speaks. And let us be empty vessels for you, I pray. We praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Blessing starting in Hebrew. I'm, I'm, go sit down. Go no, you don't interrupt now. I don't care. Miho, listen. You're not going to interrupt the Bible study. I don't care. Go over there. Go, go over there. You can drive there. Okay? You can yeah. sit down here and watch the Bible. No, don't throw it away. Sit down on the table. Miho, we started the study. Miho, you're not going to go to these anymore if you do this. Okay. Go sit down and do your iPad or come watch the study. No interrupting. All right. The blessing. The Baruka. In the Hebrew, Baruka Ta Adonai Eloheinu Melaka Alon. Asher Kichanu Bamitzatov. Vitivanu Lahayot Or. Lagoyim. Vinatan Lanu. Et Yeshua, Meshakenu, or Ta'alom. In the English, uh, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies with his commandments and commands us to be a light to the nations and gave to us Yeshua the Messiah, the light of the world. Cool. I forgot I got the... Yeah, you got the clicker. Yeah. So, as we mentioned last week, we are doing the Pauline Epistles, and uh, as, as we mentioned last week too, an epistle is, is the connotation of epistle is actually a miniature sermon, even though a lot of people like to say it's just the letters. I see, and I thought epistles were the wife of the apostles, yeah. <laughs> so, you want to comment on your little, so did you paint this? No, 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 it's actually a photograph, but I, I liked it because it's a nice little picture. We're going to be doing the epistles, and I thought, what a nice intro picture for it. It is a beautiful so, picture. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine, I was thinking when I saw this picture, can you imagine the painstaking efforts that they would partake in just to, to write those letters mm -hmm. and, this, and the gospel? So again, I'm just going to breeze through this real quick. We want to make sure... And I've heard Chauncey say this so many times, I love the fact that it gets repeated a lot. The whole thing about, and, and I was mentioning to you folks over here, the whole thing about Scripture is if we don't look at Scripture as a mirror, and it, I, it's, again, it's redundant, it, we're, we're not getting anything out of it because we're not supposed to take the Scripture and then apply it. And we're going to learn more about that. It's going to be a lot of judgmentalness and all that stuff in today's uh, passages. But the, the scripture should be something that convicts us. I don't know. Can I ask you guys a question? Do you guys feel good about messages where you walk out and you feel really convicted? You just feel like, oh, man. Because I've, I've talked to a lot of people, actually, and I, and I think it's kind of a, almost like a, a measure of growth. I've talked to people before, mostly in the younger years, when they feel like the pastors kind of hit up on something they feel guilty about, they go, oh, I'm not coming back here anymore. No. You guys ever talk to somebody like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. so you said about the, um, about the book of um, James, James, right? That people felt connected. Yep. I had never read it. So I was gone on vacation. I read it. Yeah. And I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was great. I think it's a measure of your heart. Yeah, yeah it I... kind of really made me look at where I'm at and yeah. what I need growth on. And, and I remember you saying people didn't like it. And I thought, how could they not like it if they're really seeking We kind of use it as a litmus test for yeah. counseling people. And, and uh, oftentimes when we pull out the book of James, we start going through it. We could tell what, where somebody is in their walk. And we'll either have a backup plan or whatever to kind of like spoon feed them a little bit more. But I think a lot of times James is a little too much. For some people to handle, unfortunately. Hmm. So, really, what, what we're trying to do here in this study is to 
make it so that um, through all the angles, and Chauncey is amazing, as you guys know, at this stuff here and the other stuff, but the historical and eschatological perspective, I never connected dots until I started coming to the Tuesday studies that Chauncey was doing at Noah's Ark at first, and then over here. And that, I, we're so excited because we feel we're getting a chance to connect all these dots. Historically, eschatologically, um, application-wise, and there's usually multiple applications in Scripture you can apply to your everyday life. Right. So the whole objective is to let, let His character shine through us. But one of my favorite verses, Matthew 5, 16, let your lights so shine before man that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. And it's, it's what we do that glorifies Him. And so if we can, if, you know, through this study, get us to apply Scripture more effectively in our lives, then I think we're really successful. And that word let, you just think about that little word there. That implies that it's really up to us. You know, we can put a peck measure on God's light and nobody sees the light. But God's saying, let people see it. Mm -hmm. It's already inside of us. Let it out. So that's the exciting part of this. Quick rules of engagement, like, like we mentioned last time. Uh, we feel free to comment. Please feel free to ask questions. Um, aim to edify the body with your questions if you can. This whole thing is about edifying the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And please save the baits for after the study. We'll be more happy to talk about controversial things after. We just don't want to tie people people up when we're trying to get through this because we notice that we're lucky if we're going to get through one chapter a week because we are going so deep. Yeah. Some of those things you sent me from the other related um, scriptures. scriptures, wow, they were really incredible. Chauncey put together a beautiful chart. Actually, we have an outline every for every book when we go through it. And the outline breaks down what the subject matter is going through each of the chapters. So we're still in the one to three, which is the problems of unrighteousness. And that's what we're dealing with today, th yeah, last week, this week, and next week. So recap, real quick, I'm just going to do that really quick here from last week. Jesus is the written, and you guys agree with this? Feel yes. free to comment. Is the written and the spirit of the law. Amen. He is the law and the spirit of the law. God's intention was always to write his laws on our hearts. And I think Pastor David actually commented that on, on last Saturday. Last Saturday. Yes. It's really cool that we already had that in here. We should be praying unceasingly, especially for our brethren. Now, I want to ask you guys, challenge you guys. Do we have trouble doing this? Praying for our brothers? I, I, I catch myself praying for my own needs, most of my family, and so many times I forget about you guys. And I'm so sorry. But I'm really trying to retrain myself to be more externally focused in that prayer part. And that last week convicted me, just going over the scripture. Um, fellowship is vital. Chauncey brought up a great point last last week that, you know, the gifts, the spiritual gifts that we have for the whole body, how do we how do we improve if we're not fellowshipping? We're rubbing off on each other in a good way. We're iron sharpening iron. This is what's so amazing about this fellowship too, that I've just I've just blown away from coming from the mainstream church and it's like you guys like we, I like to consider it part of my, my fellowship too now, is just into the night. Talk about the word. Talk about the word, right, Esther? Yes. <laughs> I mean, Chauncey's over at my house sometimes till one o'clock in the morning. We're still talking or about three. the word. Yes. Or four. Yes. <laughs> or four. One to four. Sometimes. Yeah, anywhere. One to four. Yeah. yeah. And being ashamed of Jesus is dangerous. Denying Jesus is denying the Father. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a, such a dangerous, dangerous position to take. To be ashamed of the gospel. Our love for God should provoke the Jews to jealousy. I think we are a living testimony towards the Jews. And like I said, it's we're not assigned to provoke the Jews to envy. We're supposed to provoke them to jealousy. Fine. The difference is it's their God. God 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 gave salvation to the Gentiles so that we might provoke the Jews to jealousy and that he would draw his people back to him. And you're going to see that at the end of Romans that Paul uses three chapters to drive home God's not done with the Jews. Right. Probably the most controversial thing we touched on last week was on the topic of homosexuality. And we talked about how God gave them over to a debased mind. Their problem was basically primarily idolatry. They were building, you know, four-footed beasts and statues and all that stuff. And God was so fed up. He says, because I'm so fed up with you, I'm going to give you to a 
debased mind where you will now do unnatural things with each other. And so when you read that carefully, and you read that in the original translations, there's no escaping it. That God used homosexuality as like a punishment to idolatry. So it's almost like, you know, people that are saying, oh, it's just, you know, it's love, it's no big deal, whatever. No. Love is love. That's what yeah. they say. I think, yeah. I think God's not too happy, especially when you think about the image of God and that he made man for, man, for, for woman, not for man. Big, big, big penalty there to sin. Proving of sin. And then it basically ended the chapter by saying, and those who not only practice that, but approve. It's almost like approving is worse than practicing. And then I thought, started thinking about the millstone thing, right? I mean, think about it. You may not even be the one sinning, but if you cause somebody to sin, because you're telling them, man, it's not a big deal. I think that might be a worse sin than doing the sin itself, because you're causing somebody else to sin. So, I, I, everything I think we need to be careful about is walking circ circumspectly so that we don't stumble others. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's the last thing we touched on. So, Johnson? Yeah, recapping from the end of Romans, Romans 1.16 said, For I am not ashamed of the good news of the Messiah, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. This is what we were just discussing and recapping over on this, is that it's just as bad to approve, to, you know, they always say evil flourishes when good men do nothing. And you, we, we have an accountability. We're, we're to be watchmen. And if we don't tell them, God says there's a judgment that's put on us, and their blood will be on our hands. So starting chapter 2, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you, who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do not and, and do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Therefore, you have no excuse. Let's go back to that, that verse. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Matthew chapter 7 says, Judge not, lest you be judged. Judging basically opens the door to be judged. Mm -hmm. And whenever you judge another, you condemn yourself. You're basically telling mm -hmm. God, Okay, I know this is wrong. I want to make sure this brother doesn't do it wrong. God's going, oh, Let me see that measuring stick. Okay, go ahead. He says, by the measure that you measure, that's the measure you'll be measured with. Exactly. And that's, but it's not just the fact we judge, but how we judge. So check this out. Exactly what Charles is saying. Perfect segue. For what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look? A plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. So, what do you think, reading this passage in Matthew, what would you say is the one thing that's got God's pet peeve here? What, what is he hating here? Go ahead, Dave. Well, to me, this is saying, I'm, I'm saying to you, stop committing adultery. And I'm committing adultery myself. And I'm telling you to stop doing it, but I'm doing it as well. I need to stop doing it first before I tell you to stop doing it. Because I'm going to be judged the same way I'm judging you. I'm judging you, saying you're doing this and you're sinning. I'm going to be judged for that sin as well. It right. isn't just a general judgment about everything. It's a particular thing that you point out in somebody's right. life. And if I am not doing that in my life, I have a right to judge a brother. Right. That's how I understand it. If I am doing that thing, I have no right to call you out on it. 
until I stop doing it. Well, I still look at it on the perspective of, you know, when we, we unless, unless somebody, you know, when, when Steve was teaching on the difference between sin offerings and guilt offerings, and he pointed out that a guilt offering, in order to bring, you know, in a sin offering or a guilt offering, they had to be something that was going to hurt somebody else. It doesn't say that in these verses, however. We're not talking about that here. That's not what this is saying. We're talking about judging somebody, and you're going to be judged by the same measure. Right. That's what it is. And exactly if you're taking full said. context of Scripture, though, from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, on it, and you're taking James in, in with it, and where it uses the context about not judging another, that using the Bible as a mirror to judge ourselves. Right. You know what I mean? Sure, we want to help. We see a brother stumbling. We want to make sure that we help them so that in love, we exhort them to keep them from stumbling. But that's, that's more of exhorting than it is actually judging. Well, if you don't point it out, then... You know, it's saying, what, what did you just read? And you don't yeah. tell him the, you've got consequences. You can, but you can tell somebody without judging them. Yeah. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, this is saying judge. This is not saying, I'm going by what this says, not fabricating something else that I think it might mean. This is exactly what this says. I don't know if it's supposed to mean something else. But it's not saying something. I'll put it this way. When I'm driving down the road, and I've said this before, somebody cuts me off, I think, ah, they're probably in a hurry. Right. Why? Because I know when I go before the throne, I'm going to need all the leave way right. I can. So no matter what area I'm going to be judged in, I'm right. going to give people a lot more leave way right. because of the fact that I'm going to want leave way when I'm judged. And that's yeah. basically yeah. what we're saying here because we're looking at the hypocrisy. And hypocrisy. God's... And that's, God's basically that's saying, the question. yes. That's what he doesn't like. That's what he doesn't like. That's what he doesn't like. Yeah. He doesn't like us being hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So God's word, like Chauncey's saying, is a mirror. We're supposed to look at it and apply it to ourselves before you slam it on top of somebody's head. So, but are we also cattle for how we judge God? I want to share with something with you guys that I think is really, really interesting. Look at this passage. I'm going to read this to you. The parable of the meanings. Okay. And I, I, I put this for fun because I. I want you guys to really think about what we're reading here. Now, as they heard these sayings, he spoke another parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered them ten minas, and said to them, do business until I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent the delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants, to whom he had given the money, to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful and very little have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept, put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas, for I say to you, that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. All right. How would you interpret that? Huh? I want to hear what you guys have to say about that. 
somebody else's turn. If you're faithful with the little, I, I mean, that's obvious that he's going to give you more. Okay. If you don't use them at all, it takes them completely away. And you're considered possibly not even saved. Okay. I also look at it like God gives us talents, like things in our lives that we're supposed to do, yes, right? And if we don't do them and we don't share them with others, then you might not bless us with more. So we're basically uh, blessed based on our faithfulness of what we use that he gives us. I remember I asked too what uh, about judgment, remember? But are we also cattle for how we judge God? Now picture that parable mm -hmm. and that servant Basically judging the master, saying, "But you're austere, you're unfair, and you're whatever." Right? If you see God as being a very harsh, harsh God, He will be a harsh God to you. If you see a, if you see God as being a loving, compassionate God, He's going to be a loving, compassionate God. Yes, God. Well, I think we're learning that God judgment is certain, and the judgment is going to be based on the truth. So if you're not living the life of truth, you can expect the judgment. Yes. And when we judge others, or we judge those sin, we're not we're, we're judging the sin, but we're also judging the agent who is committing the sin. And when we judge that agent, as it says, we have committed the same sin. So we're basically, we are passing judgment on ourselves when we pass judgment on the others who have committed that sin. I think through all of this, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility. You're, you're not just responsibility for your own self. Uh -huh. You are responsible for the other person. Are you leading them into sin? Are you helping them to get out of sin? Because remember, he who does not do the right thing also commits a sin. This is a That's big right. deal. It goes yes. around and yes. around and around, right. and there is no escape from it for those of us who want to follow God. But the end, the judgment is certain, but judgment is going to be based upon the truth, and the truth is what God's word is. Okay. And then truth would be, it would look like obedience. Yeah, truth, Torah is truth, right? As you've said many, many times. That, that the truth then is lived out through obedience. But lived out through obedience. Right. I want to touch on something Chauncey mentioned. How do you guys perceive God um, as an austere master? Mm -hmm. Somebody who's out to squash you? Like that servant basically was basically his portrayal of God was, you're you're a tough so I just played it safe. I didn't do anything for you because I figured that the minute I make a mistake, you're just going to squash me, right? Isn't that kind of the attitude he had? Mm -hmm. okay. just did, there was a whole sermon on this on Saturday on God's on God's characteristics, right? Okay. Let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. David was known. I mentioned this to a couple of you guys before. What was David known as? A man what? After God's own heart. Why? Loved God. He, loved God. he had an intimate relationship with God. He trusted Him. Most people, when, when, we ask, when I've asked that question, they say, because I know I talked to you about it. Esther, no fair. <laughs> well, go ahead. What, what, was, what do most people say, David is a man after all? Because he repented. He right. repented. But, ooh, ooh. but oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes, you, right. want, you want to give the, the other answer to Lucky it? was, this has been ministering to me so much this week. He not only repented, but once he went after he repented, he realized his sin of Bathsheba and the baby died. He got up, washed his face, and he worshipped because he is worthy of all our worship. So here he is sitting at the dining table. Picture this, and he's praying to God. God, please, please heal my baby. Heal my baby. Heal my baby, please. Then he sees the people coming in, the messengers. Come in. He knows the news. And they're all scared to death. You don't want to give the king bad news. It could, what could happen to you? He says, my baby dead? Yes. King David, your baby is dying. What does he do? He gets up on the table. And this is after he's committed murder, committed adultery. And I'm not saying that we should take sin lightly. This is not my message. But he says, I have grieved. I've given it to God. I trusted that he forgives me. Now, this is important, you guys. Because you know what, Patty and I have, last, last year, I don't know what it is, we've had, had 
couple people that just could not allow themselves to move forward from, you know, and, and Esther's been really good about sharing with me too that Philippians 3 has really, really ministered to her about, one thing I do, Paul says, I look forward to the upward calling of our Lord Jesus Christ, forgetting all those things that are in the past, but remembering what's in the future, what's upward, what's forward. Amen. And if you can't accept God's forgiveness, <laughs> if you see God as an austere master who says, oh, I don't know about that, though. That last one, I don't think I can forgive you for that one. That's not God. But I think God. a lot of times people people don't have a, a hard time forgiving God. They have a hard time forgiving themselves. And for me, it's not what I've done to myself, but what I've done to other people, how I've hurt others. And that's where I think it's hard. But, but, I can but, forgive God and forgive true. myself. But forgive Michelle? myself. And that's kind of a play on words, but I agree with what you're saying. You're having trouble forgiving yourself. But if you truly, truly, truly right. trust in God, right. who says, Michelle, I don't care what you think of yourself. Right. These are self. Right. All that matters is what I think of you. Right. Yeah. Guess what? Yeah. Release. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah. And like also what, what you know what you did if you repented because he's the I am, not the I was, not the I'm gonna be. He is the I am. And I think that's something important to remember about right. God. That that's great. It's it's right now. And so where the state of your heart is right now, and your you know your act of repentance is right now. Yeah is how he's viewing you right now, not right. what you did, as long as you're repenting from what you did, but and right. not what you're going to do in the future for the human. What Christian's saying is, yeah. it's not how you start the race, it's how you finish the race. Amen. Mm -hmm. Wisely said. No, but, but here, the thing that's so critical about this whole passage is, I don't think we get just how serious it is when God says, go, I forgive you. Now make good use of yourself and forget what you did. Yeah. And if we sit there and wallow and wallow, I, I don't think we really see how serious that is. Because really what you're saying to God is, I know you're saying you're forgiving, but I don't really trust you. You get that? That's why he tied the verse in with, without faith you can't please God. The yeah. gesture of exactly. faith. Because you're not really believing God when he tells you he forgives you. If you are condemning yourself, Instead of allowing it to convey well, yeah. also if you're not truly repentant, which mm -hmm. means you don't ever do that thing again. You, you don't right. ever to repent means turn around, go back, don't ever do it again. That's true repentance. And you know, a lot of people just expect this over and over and over. They keep doing the same thing. But but but, but Denise, this is what I'm saying though, and then you're hundred percent correct. But that's what I mean about the David man after God's own heart. People will say, well, he's a man after God's heart because he actually repented and he didn't go round and round and round. We all accept that. But what made David, I think, cut above is those people couldn't understand. They're going, well, David, what do you, what do you, what are you, are you, did you hear what we just said? Your baby died. And David says, I heard what you said. But I'm ready to move forward now. Well, and he had been fasting the whole time the baby was dying. So he was That's really my point, because he's already spirit. done his repenting. Yeah. Now he goes to the next higher level. Right. If you guys want to carry your walk with God to a higher level, because I think all of you guys, I know, I know all of you guys pretty well, I think you're pretty repentant when you do stuff that, that hurts God. But I don't know, are you able to walk forward and say, I'm really an idiot. But you know what? You love me. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do next? That's the running the good race. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Do you think that that's that he illustrated that um, <clears throat> when he depicted Lot's wife and said, "Don't look back." That that was Ooh. an actual like wow. depiction nice picture. for yeah. that. You know, wow. look back. You know. Yeah. yeah. Thank like, you. Trust yeah. Me, Wonderful. <laughs> to me, it's a, it's yeah. a, it's no, epitomized oh, the verse where God says the righteous man will fall a thousand times and get back up again. Right. But the wicked fall once and great is their fall. The reason we can get back up again every time we fall okay. is because we got God there to help us out. Amen. Amen. Donna, I saw you. I can't wait no. to hear Donna's comment because no, she didn't say anything. That's okay. I think the forgiveness thing. We as mortal people, you aren't going to always feel it, but what you have to do is believe it. Amen. Faith. Wow. Yeah. Have the faith. Wow. Nailed it. Greg and then he has it. God says he'll, he'll uh, not remember our sin anymore. God oh, chooses right. not to remember our sin, and we should follow that, that mm -hmm. leading. Yeah. 
This is what I mean about the study. This is what Charlie and I are all looking for. Digging deep like this. Tony, go ahead. And I've only known Tony for about 30 years. We were talking about judgment before. Right. And I see when I place judgment on other people and I'm unforgiving, I see God in that light with myself. And I see the two tied together. If we're free, we have that forgiving spirit of others, I tend to see God having that forgiving spirit with me. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at other people and not being forgiven and pointing my finger, I see God looking at me the same way. Mm -hmm. Right. So it'll be kind of like God has mercy on, on those who have mercy. Have mercy. Yes. Yes. Right. It's it's right. to see that you and how can forgive. God forgive us if we're not willing to forgive others? Exactly. But it also, it sets the precedence for how we think about it. Yes. Exactly. How you see him. How you see him. Exactly. Yeah. It sets the whole stage. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Good. Thanks. Great feedback. Uh, so how would you interpret the passage? We talked about that. But his citizens hated him, the master, and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Does that sound like the world today? God. Okay. But, but what's the relevant thing here? Regardless of the citizens' hate for the master, did the servants have duties to fulfill? Yes. Did they go, oh, they really hate you, God. And they're going to hate me now, so I'm just going to... Quiet and not do anything. He says, What? Go and do what I called you to do. Call the servants, deliver to them ten minutes, and said to them, Do business. That's us. Do business until he gets back. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. I know I sound like I'm talking a lot, but Chance is mm -hmm. the one who actually is. Chose to let me do this. Sorry, sir. Okay. I'm going to let you take a free reign with it. I talked <laughs> enough throughout the week. So then another yeah. came saying, Master, here's your meeting, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I fear you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you do not sow. And he said, so, so not God. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew or supposed, by the way, in the Greek, that, that was like supposed. So he supposed that the Master. It was austere. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people would suppose God is, but he's not. He's, he's gracious and merciful. Collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. He was guilty of being, one, lazy, you know, lazy. And two, he was accountable for how he viewed the master. Mm -hmm. You guys did a great job of depicting all that. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you. Wow. So the way we look at God is the way God is going to judge us for how we see God. Think about that. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth. This is the only thing that matters. It's only the truth of Scripture. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things, is doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? And, and this word escape... Um, many times it's, it's, uh, it, it comes after a snare, okay? So the Bible, the original Greek, of course, English, of course, is the worst language to translate into. But this is literally escaping, like, from a snare or a trap. So what you did here is you set yourself in a little trap. Mm -hmm. I just uh, judge this person. You're a real jerk. Mm -hmm. Guess what you just did? You set yourself in a trap. Mm -hmm. Now God's going to hold you accountable for that same thing. God's truth is the only measure stick that matters. Judgmental people are setting traps for themselves. It's clear that God hates hypocrisy. On the other hand, he loves those who show compassion and mercy. Tony, what you said, this is exactly what Tony is talking about. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mm -hmm. Matthew 5, 7. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness and humility. I'm doing another translation, sorry. Uh, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Guys, I did, this, I did a really in-depth study on this. This is most, one of the most revealing things I've ever, ever checked into. This Galatians 6, 1 and 2. In the original language, it says, man, uh, if a man's overtaken and trapped, you who are spiritual, restore... Such a man in the spirit of gentleness, that word restore is the same word that, that they would use to take a, a broken bone and put it back into place very carefully, making sure it was perfectly lined up 
but doing whatever they could to comfort that person who was being treated. Think about that. And I think a lot of times when we come alongside and we find somebody who's kind of messing up and a trespass, we want to go, hey, let's go, uh, let's go wail on this guy. That's not the spirit that we're supposed to have. We were supposed to have a spirit of meekness and humility, lest you also be tempted. Wow. I couldn't believe what I was reading. It was basically saying, if you don't do this, you just open yourself up to temptation. I'm going to be the first to confess. Can you guys, maybe, I don't know if you guys have experienced it. I've done this before. I've come on hard on people before about a certain sin. And then I get found in the same sin shortly after that. Has that ever happened to you guys? Or am, I, am I the only one? No. <laughs> Aren't you just as guilty? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it's happened to me several times in my life, and I'm like so embarrassed before God because I'm going, "Oh, I, oh God, okay, I get it." And and honestly, in my earlier days, I just kind of ignored it. In my later days, I did this with you one time. I came caught you in the breezeway because I, you and I got in the yelling match on the phone one time. Yeah. And Pastor David did a, a really cool message on something. And I just felt so guilty. I had to see Chauncey the very next day and say, Chauncey, did you forgive me? Because I was really, remember that? Because yeah. I was really out of line. I have a tendency to get really exuberant and I just get real adamant about things, you know? And that's just my style. I get a type A type of person. So you were, you were yeah. lacking gentleness in that situation? I lacked total gentleness. <laughs> well, because Chauncey and I have the type of relationship right. where... Water off a duck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I still think I need to be sensitive sometimes. And I felt I hurt him. So. Yeah. Well, if you're, if you're looking at that person and, and too much and then you get the same sin, it's just as bad as if you didn't say anything at all, right? Right. No, but what I'm saying is this, is that, is that later on in life, as you, uh, you guys are all, I'm sure, there too, but what I learned when I matured in the Lord was not just ignore it. I literally had to come to the person and say, I need to ask for your forgiveness. And that's tough. I don't know about you guys, but that's still kind of tough for me sometimes. Because I feel like I was right. Right. <laughs> but then I realized God is saying, but your methodology was yeah. really bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to ask for forgiveness for the methodology, not just my point. Yeah. And sometimes I don't even draw my point anymore. I have. I've said, yeah. I still disagree with what you're saying, but I just I didn't carry myself in a proper manner. But sometimes I don't even go to my point. I just feel like I need to. I, I was thinking about when I was visiting my dad out in Arizona, and he was all excited about me going over to the Bible study group with him to hear the Bible study and like that and stuff. And that uh, story. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I nothing I said was wrong. It was all correct, mm -hmm. right. but it wasn't my house. It was their Bible study, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, the the. You know, there were little things about him that did the Bible study that I didn't know, and, and so he took things real personally. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my dad was embarrassed. My brother-in-law were embarrassed. They were like, you know, they apologized for me, you know. <laughs> and, and I, you know, the part that I guess concerned me the most was I didn't really feel any nudgings or anything in me like I was saying something mm -hmm. out of the Spirit. You know, and what I was saying was correct, mm -hmm. but like I said, it wasn't my house, and I think the biggest problem was it wasn't my Bible study, mm -hmm. and um, and the I respect. I should have showed more respect mm -hmm. to their for their for their. I, Bible I don't want to belabor it, but no, I'm fine. learning the difference between walking in the in the, the law. Is the, I can convince. I I'm growing to love the law more and more. I didn't know that until I came to Rock Valley, right. and. I can convince another person, yeah, you've got to keep the law. If I convince you to keep the law, I have actually set you up for failure. Right. Because you're going to try and do it so well. Yeah, i got to do it. And you're going to do it in your own strength. Right. And you're going to fail. Yeah. But if yeah. the, the Holy Spirit convinces you, He equips you yes. to success. Yeah. Yes. So that's how we keep the law, the spirit of the law. Because if I do it in my flesh, I'm doing the letter of the law. Well, when it's written on your heart, yes, you love. So spirit. without the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you seal love, my lips, O oh Lord. Yeah. If you don't, that's what, what I have to say. If you don't want to do it, it's not written on your heart. Exactly. And, and, and way, let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. Say a little bit, leave the rest to Him. Amen.
Mm -hmm. Alright. All right. So what's the crux of the Christian attitude then supposed to be? What would you say? Gentleness, love, Ooh. patience, give them the grace to learn it. Beautiful. You say it and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. How's you bring that? it to their attention, let them let him do it. Nothing be done through selfish ambition and conceit, but in loveliness of mind, yeah. let each esteem others better than himself. I think we should read that every morning before we get up. <laughs> <laughs> really? yeah. Yeah. It's a good verse. Be 100% honest. Yeah. You guys have trouble with this sometimes? Esteeming others better than yourself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. I do. I, would, I, would, I know I'm the best. No, I'm I would say I don't have trouble with it sometimes. I would say I have trouble with it all the time. Yeah. Oh, you always have to have the most. Don't you? <laughs> there he goes again. <laughs> I'll just. Like, That's another one of mine. I can't believe I'm like. Hey, you you picked them. I mean, no, you don't want to pick them. You said, why don't you pick the, the chapter three? I'll pick two, and then we sent these back. No, no, I, no. <laughs> Never mind. Never no, mind. you put the clovers and the bells on, on all the pages, and then I just added some pages to the windshield. Oh, I thought you were Hey, move on, guys. No, no, focus, no, focus. Okay. focus. Yeah. Anyway, you didn't have to win out. Yeah. So is this the mercy stuff? Oh, you know what? Remember last week we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and how Paul really got mad at the church of Corinth because they didn't judge the young man who was in sin. Now, is this contradictory? I mean... What this judgment stuff. I mean, we're, why is Paul getting so whacked out? Wasn't he supposed to be more gentle on, on, on these things? But his or? delivering of the judging is what, what was harsh. Not Judgment doesn't necessarily have to be harsh in and of itself. It was how he decided to play out the fact that he was judging them. Because you can be mercifully judging, can't you? Can you? I don't know. Anybody else? It's a good answer, but I'm looking for something else. Uh, well, now we're learning that he went through the proper channels. Huh? He went well, first quietly. Well, there's that whole so channels. A little leaven leavens the whole loaf. Uh -huh. Yeah. So is church discipline and judgment a little bit different than a one person saying, you're a jerk and you shouldn't be doing yes. this? Yes. As opposed to the church recognizing there is sin going on in this person's life and they need to lovingly because if you don't, if you let somebody go off in their error, that's not very loving. They're going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So Paul was angry at the church because they were basically boasting about, look, we're full of grace. Mm -hmm. We didn't come down on this guy, even though he had sex with his stepmother. No. Paul said, you should have come down on this guy. Mm -hmm. In fact, you should have kicked him out, mm -hmm. cast him off to Satan so his flesh would be destroyed, so his spirit might be saved. And so, Leviticus 22 said real clearly, you're not to uncover your stepmother's nakedness. So why is discipline to be done by the church leaders? For our safety, the safety of the body. Literally to protect, like Chauncey just said, a little leaven leavens the whole one. If you don't nip it in the bud, pretty soon, and sexual sin, by the way, if you really look at the history of the church, that is what Paul was very, very concerned about, because that was running rampant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sexual sin. Well, and if you look at some of God's laws and they seem, well, gee, that seems kind of harsh, especially when you look at society today where they're mm -hmm. basically breaking all of them. Mm -hmm. And then you go back and you say, oh, gee, where did HIV come from? Oh, because they didn't crack down on that. Right? Where did this, where did the venereal diseases come? Oh, because they didn't crack down on that. So did it end up hurting other people? Did it end up hurting society as a whole? Yeah, right. it did. Right. It infected everybody. I think we need to remember that. All of what we're supposed to do for God goes against our grain because we are exactly. mortal, sinful people. None of this is going to come naturally out of you. Yeah. It's only going to come out of you if you allow the Holy Spirit Which to do Which is the it. reason why God wanted there to be many when there came to be some sort of counsel. Because in the counsel of many, there's safety. One man, one woman, we can be off. But if we're all hearing the same thing from the Holy Spirit, you know that's God. Right? And that safety thing, isn't that beautiful again how the Old Testament, oh, it's, let's not listen to the Old Testament, it's not for us anymore. No, it says the same thing. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counsel, there is what? Safety. 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 It's the very same thing that Paul was trying to preach for the Corinthians. Is you guys are putting yourself in danger. 
Just as Moses was instructed to appoint judges, the church is to have structure. Exodus 18, Titus, 1 Timothy. The bottom line, let nothing be done with selfish motives. Everything's got to be about the body. Oh, I got a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Just one. Romans 2.4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. This is from Job 21. He says that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. The same one he's talking about. Who shall declare his way to his face. And who shall repay him what he has done. In Psalms he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit you at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule you in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at your right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen, he shall fill the places with the dead bodies, he shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. Now all of this is basically talking about the day of wrath that's coming in. One of the points that people seem to miss a lot of times about eschatology, eschatology does two things. One, it proves God is God, that this is God's word. Because how is it that he speaks of things that haven't happened yet, and when they occur, he's proving out that this is his word. So you can look through scripture, you can see where he said it in his word, and then it happened in history, and it's proving God's word. The second thing, and I think the most important one about prophecy, the purpose of prophecy is not so we know what happens before it happens. The purpose of prophecy is so that we can look where the story ends, and then take that to judge how should we live our lives. Yep. What should our lives be knowing that the day of wrath is coming? What kind of a life should we live? What kind of a man should I be knowing that this is where things are going? So, Chauncey, would you say that prophecy is, I've heard it said, foretelling and then foretelling. And the foretelling is a future thing, but the foretelling is not where somebody can actually just, without even knowing it, be quoting something, a script, something scriptural, and everybody goes, oh my gosh, I really needed to hear that. Or, right, or hear right. That. and that's one of the things about it. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Mm. And so, when we abide in him, and he in us, then his word becomes a living word, and whatever we're speaking to the person we're talking to at that time, mm. it's going to be that spirit of prophecy in their life of what they need at that time. Right. And, and that's mostly what prophecy is about. Like I said, Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's the spirit we walk in. And that spirit that we're walking in is supposed to convict us to how we should live our lives. Right. You know, I always think back on Joel when he goes into talking about the battle where the army of the Lord comes in and slaughters everybody. And he says, knowing this, therefore, how should we live our lives? In other words, he's saying, look, you pick now which side you're going to be on. You can be the army that's immortal, that, that slaughters everybody, or you can be the army that gets slaughtered. Up to you. You get a pick now. Yeah. So he says, rent your hearts, not your garments. Don't give an outward expression of it. Tear your hearts open. Mm -hmm. Open your hearts to God from the conviction of what's going on that we might live holy lives set apart for God. Did you draw that? Yeah, that's one of my paintings. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm a little OCD, so I actually drew the organs, then drew the skeleton over, then drew the flesh over, and then erased sections to, to get the blast done. Good. Now, the great day of the Lord is near. 
It is near and hastens greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. All of these are referring to the day of the Lord, which is the last thousand year period. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities, against the high towers, and I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as dung. Wow. That sounds a little serious, don't yeah. you think? He will judge everyone according oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Go ahead. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. Karma has nothing to do with it. <laughs> God is not just a loving God, but holy and just. He must judge righteously. It's His character. So He has to judge. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whoever one sows that will he also reap, for the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh, reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. James says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless or dead? I think it says in King James. Yeah. yeah. Fear is often misunderstood. Matthew 10, 28 scripture versus the James scripture. Let me, can you guys tell me what you guys think is the difference between the two fears represented here? Chauncey did a really in-depth study of the word fear, I think, and I'll, I'll ask you to comment in a minute, yeah. but that, that really opened my eyes a lot. But go ahead, you guys, what's the difference here? Why is one fear seemingly good, and one, one fear seems one, bad? One teaches you a lesson. One puts uh, fear into you that you may not make it into heaven. Okay, good. Well, I don't, you don't need to fear more man. Don't fear man. Man can kill your body, but it's God who can kill your eternity. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pick one, pick the one that's, you know, got the power. And fear, it doesn't mean, it's more like a reverence. That's right. You know, in the, the previous verse that said God is not mocked, you know, we, we can't make a fool out of God. Whenever right. we don't believe something he says, we're almost calling him a liar. And, really don't want to go down that road, but the fear you have is the reverence and a respect for the power that he has and the fact that he is in total control of the world and the future. And, he can and men can't do nearly to you what God can do. So, so in a weird way, you almost fear God more than you do men. You should. Go ahead. One fear that de the, the demons, they want to get away from God. Ah. And the other one says, I'd be terrified to be without God. That's a summation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and his fear doesn't doesn't change their rebellion hearts towards God. That's right. There's no repentance. In There's it. no repentance at all. But look look at that revelation. Even the demons believe. Yeah. Right. Look at that. The demon world knows that there is a God. Well, they absolutely yeah. convinced there's God. We're not demons, and we're the ones who have got the problem believing. They believe it, but they don't. They know, know who he is. Right. They just they didn't pick that side. But it doesn't change their life. Mm -hmm. So a godly fear leads to wisdom, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. wisdom, and then wisdom leads to repentance. And repentance leads to the faith that produces good works. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. A little mm -hmm. theorem. Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Where is a person's heart with God? To me, this has always been a litmus test. I've loved this passage. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase his learning. The fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Something I remember my father told me that I think is probably the most profound thing that I've held on to is if you look at the, the person who's teachable versus the one who's not teachable, he says, don't be fooled by what you see in this world, the people that love to talk it up and act all smart. Usually the smartest person in the room is the one who doesn't think he's very smart, but he listens and learns. Think about it. It makes so much sense. If you think you know everything and you're not really going to take any more information in from other people, because, yeah, no, I got my own opinion on that. How smart is that person going to get? Probably not very smart. But a person who sits there and actually hears and listens, they're going to be like Mark. <laughs> no, you're a good listener, Mark. You are. So anyway, this to me is somebody uh, is a, a scripture that I've uh, you know when I've tried to you know teach or whatever, and somebody is really rejecting towards God's word, it kind of tells you right away where their hearts are at, because their hearts are filled with pride, and the humble hearts are teachable. But, I just to oh, okay. So a healthy relationship with God does include the fear of the Lord. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and include good works. Philippians 2, 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, it's interesting. Out of the 14 words that it uses in the Hebrew for fear, yep. only two of those are reverence. Mm -hmm. The other are with trembling. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to be... People have to recognize, you know, I mean, there's almost this buddy mentality with mm -hmm. God. Yeah. God's still God. He's still, that's right. God is still God, and there's a certain amount of... Um, that you have to recognize the fact that the fear of the Lord, the love of the Lord will keep you striving for God and seeking His face. Yeah. But the fear of the Lord is what's going to keep you from sin. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. And that, uh, the word fear, used in this particular passage, is where the word phobia came from. And it's like to flee and withdraw, literally in a short definition, if you look at it directly in the Greek, it's fear, terror, or reverence, but literally terror and alarm. So, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with terror, alarm, and trembling. Whenever I've spoken to some people that are into the hyper grace movement, they're going, it's not about works, it's all about grace. I mean, I'm saved by grace. Through faith. It's true. It is true. But true the faith word, the word work. includes works. Otherwise, it's not true faith. Go ahead. What does the word work there mean? Like, what is the definition of work? Deeds. 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 Um, you know, like when it talks about Matthew and the revelation about the, 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 um, the saints who are clothed in white, which represents the deeds of the saints. Those are the good works that we did. Righteous acts. Righteous acts, but remember in Corinthians, and it goes on to say that our works will be taken by fire, or will be tested by fire, mm -hmm. and that which is left is all that's basically mm -hmm. going to be rewarded to us. So it's not just good works, it's the ones that we've done in rightful motives. Mm -hmm. It goes so, back to the whole thing about the, the fact that, yes, our salvation is through the grace of God, through faith. You can't do anything to earn it. But, okay, now we've got the starting line. How much of the life of Christ are you going to develop in you so that when you go before God, who's an all-consuming fire and all flesh burns up, what's going to be left? How much of the life of Christ is going to be left in you in the presence of God when the flesh burns up? I like what you just said about that starting line. I always think about, and it's so weird, I think back when I was 16 years old, I worked for this, you guys remember this hardware store called Handyman? It was a hardware store and mm -hmm. I worked in the nursery. And I always remember picturing myself going in there, had this horrible attitude because I hated going to work, punching the card, clunk, and it's like the start of my day. That was just the start. Salvation. 
Of course, that's a real positive thing, it's not a horrible thing. <laughs> Salvation. <laughs> Salvation. But a lot of Christians treat it like, that's it. That's it, I'm done. I'm done. Got my Finish so, what do you do? So. You punch in and go to the lounge and sit down? Yeah. I don't think so. Well, yeah, let's work out your salvation. Amen. Fear I and mean, trembling. You're, you're, and you're Thanks, never, Denise, for bringing that verse. You're never actually good. saved. You're not actually saved until he comes and gets you. Yeah. That's when you're saved. Right. You know, when, when, he, when he comes back. And what is not taught often enough is this word called sanctification. Because, you know... We punch in with salvation. What about the rest of your life? That's the sanctification. Mm -hmm. That's everything. That's what we do to get to the glorification. You mentioned this last yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. And it's also my message yeah. to men's breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God, must, God must be harping on this for a reason. That, well, right. you know, if you really get down to it, this is our walk. Yeah. That is our walk. Our walk is just that, justification, sanctification, and glorification. And this is what I mean about James. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. James puts it right out there and says, Your move. God just saved you. Your move. What are you going to do with it now? And, and the, the mainstream church goes, uh, It's not about work, so yeah, I'm saved. Yay. Can okay, God serve me? I don't think so. That's not what he's looking for. You don't have to do a thing. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives a prize? So Paul's trying to draw this picture of how the race is supposed to be. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wrath, but we do it for an imperishable wrath. How much more should we do that? So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating in the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. disqualified. Mm. That, that kind of sounds fearful. I mean, remember we just talked about work up your salvation and fear and trembling? Paul seemed like he kind of got that. Well, and, and you ask anybody, so do you think Paul was saved? <laughs> I think everybody's going to pretty much agree yeah. Paul was saved, you know. But you have to think to yourself, why? Why do we have to do this? If we're already saved, why do I have to do anything about my sanctification? Because we have to remember, we are supposed to now walk through the wor world showing what it means to be a believer in God. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to affect people. They're going to look at us and right. say, what do you have that I don't? What do you know that I don't know? Why are you so calm? Why are you so nice? Why are you so agreeable? You, you've got something I don't have. We're already saved. He's mm -hmm. not going to drop us out of his hand, but uh, now our duty now is to show that God to everybody else. This is what God will do if you are a believer. This is what God will give well, you. He'll I help you like he helped yourself. More important like personally is the fact that how much the life of Christ you develop in you here, right now, is what you take with you through eternity. You don't develop more life of Christ when you get to heaven. Mm -hmm. It's all done right here in the testing ground. That's a good point. And that's the real glory. When he talks about, you know, um, in salvation, about some will shine like the stars of the firmament, he's talking about different levels of glorification. So knowing that there's a prize, and that the prizes vary according to your walk, that should affect your walk. Amen. Really. So what is the definition of sanctification? Basically... I, I'm calling it running the race, but but it is how much of the life of Christ you develop here in this life. What was the question? It is. What it, is the definition? Maturing. Well, the, the, but but biblically, uh, the Greek basically talks about being set aside, right? Um, being made holy. So these are the things that are basically what defines sanctification: being made holy, being set aside for Christ. Does that word appear in the? Yeah, there's special. several places that talk yeah. about sanctification. Yeah, it, it's actually going throughout there, but all everything I've been teaching on Leviticus right now has been on the exact exact same thing. It's been, what does it mean to live holy lives? Mm -hmm. It's about holiness. He goes into, okay, what does it mean personally to live a holy life? What does it mean as a nation to live a holy life? Right. What does it mean to be a priest to live a holy life? What's it mean to, you know, what's... What sets apart when you go into this land? It's the next part I'm teaching is holiness in a holy land. This the land was defiled by sin, right, right. so now he's saying this is what it's going to take to make that land set apart and holy again. 
just be careful. If you're going to do a word study in sanctification, there are scriptures I can't remember off the top of my head that basically say we have been set aside, we are sanctified in Christ, which makes it sound like a past tense. But mm -hmm. context, as you know, in scripture is it's present tense. Yeah. So basically, you're you're looking at sanctification as an ongoing process mm -hmm. that we are always under. Go ahead, Dave. Well, that word sanctification is something that I used to think or ask. How does that look like? Right. How, what, what is being set apart really look like? And, mm -hmm. and it took, mm -hmm. took me a while for me to understand that until uh, I got to Galatians 5 with, with the fruits of, of the, the fruit spirit. of the Spirit. Right. And, and when we talked about it, I thought that was like, okay, that's the first step. That's, this is love. And then the next one is, mm -hmm. is th love this way. character. Yeah. Right. But when I heard our pastor here says, "What if you're in the spirit? You it says fruit. It doesn't say fruits. It means you got all of them at the at the same time." And that was like, "Whoa!" Uh, I've heard um, too that the fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit is love. All the other ones come from, from love. Love. Yeah. parts of love. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Now what's okay. interesting is the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love fear. is fear. Fear, yeah. but not the fear of the Lord. Right. That's the difference. That's what separates. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. Right? So we're to be fearful of nothing other than the Lord. Everything has its proper place. The proper place for fear is with God. Amen. You were going to say that? Yeah, you know, the way I've always seen it is there seems to be a, a sanctification in two parts. You know, there's a sanctification when we are called yes. by God the Father, like it says here in Peter. You know, it says, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the yep. Father, yep. and sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That, that sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ when He died yep. has been applied to us already, which, which does sanctify us and purify us. Right. So we, we start out in a sanctification process being set apart from God, or for God. Mm -hmm. But then, now that we are saved and sanctified, now there's a walking in that and further sanctification. You notice that in that passage, what's that word that was also used? Foreknowledge? See, and a lot of times I think people forget that. They they look at that and they say, you know, okay, so we're already sanctified. But, and you're right, because God is outside of time, as you always so well teach. God's outside of time, so the ones that are born again and saved, we're already sanctified, right? We are, because He already knows where we are going to Go and what we are going to end up. It's foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change from our perspective what our responsibility is, and that is to be ye sanctified. Mm -hmm. Be ye holy for I am holy. So it's a process that he challenges us to be, but from his perspective, we're already there. See, do you get what I'm saying? Yes, it's almost impossible to explain in human terms. I, I like the you know that verse I keep mm -hmm. going back to, and the righteous will fall a thousand times and get back up again. God gives us a fresh start every day. Our walk is daily. It doesn't matter what yesterday happened. In, in essence, we start out sanctified, but then Amen. we get dirty, we, get, we can get sanctified again. We can keep cleaning up. We can keep growing. But we're, what we're doing is it's a process that the more of the life of Christ that's developed in us, once we get past one level, we move on to the next level. So he's continuing. He's saying, okay, look, if I show you all your sin at once, right. you're not even going to get out of bed. So I'm going to reveal to you a little bit at a time, and we're going to deal with that as much as you are willing and able to let it go. Right. And then we can move on to the next sin, and we'll deal with that. And then we can move on to the next sin and deal with that. Yes. It shows the danger of holding on. Yes. You're not going anywhere. Yes, because you can hold on to it, and you know what? You never get to move to the next. You're, you're stuck there. I know when, when, when my first wife left, I, was, I, I would say I was um, spiritually crippled for 10 years. I should have, I had an opportunity for growth. And instead, I allowed it to cripple me. And because of that, instead of growing all that time, I stayed right at the same place for 10 years. What a waste. Isn't sanctification also like refinement too? Yeah. 
Sure. Yeah. Be holy. I mean, we're being made holy mm -hmm. and sanctified. And as you. as as we as we are refined in that process, like Chauncey is saying, we're actually storing for ourselves treasures in heaven too. So, it's like in a race, we're getting more and more refined and better shape condition, and we're also getting rewards. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their deeds. According to the deeds, according to what they did. So yes, is salvation a free gift? Yes, it is. But if you look at it, this is the second judgment. This is the, the second resurrection. And they're being judged by their deeds, by their actions, by what they did. Now, I see this as the grace of God. And I'll tell you why. The first resurrection is all believers. It's all believers. The second resurrection, you've got a combination of people that weren't in the first resurrection that are now believers, and people that are not believers. Mm -hmm. And in going through this, you hear people where they say, wow, what about that guy that was out in the middle of Africa or something like that and didn't hear about Jesus? And the Bible tells you God has given them a conscience to know right from wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll be honest, I wouldn't want to be judged by my deeds. No one is without excuse. Yeah, I, I, would, I wouldn't want to. But, if they're lost already, I see that as the grace of God because He's the perfect judge. I'm glad that I don't have to judge other people. I can't judge intent and motive anyway. But God can. He knows the hearts. And so He's going to be the perfect judge who judged justly. Amen. Yeah. Which ties into the next verse. The, uh, That's another one of my Layman's, Layman's term, uh, great white throne judgment? Yeah, great white throne judgment. Right. The second resurrection, when... when Satan leads the armies against Jerusalem at the end of the Millennium Kingdom. When God, in his anger, as it says in the scriptures, um, his fierce anger, it doesn't just burn up the armies. According to the scriptures on it, he literally burns up heaven and earth. In his anger, when he gets angry, heaven and earth melt. And that's when the second resurrection comes into play. God creates a new heaven and a new earth, but in the second resurrection, that's where everybody who ever lived that wasn't in the first resurrection, it now comes up to be judged by what's written in the books. Yeah. And they're judged by what? Their deeds, by their actions. Yeah. He says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So he opens books, and they're judged by what's in those books. What are these books? <laughs> what is a book? Well, my personal view is that this is the book of life. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. That's my personal opinion. So, yeah. so they're basically judged by what, how they were obedient to his word. Mm -hmm. That's how they're judged. Now, I, I, um, I don't know if you guys remember, the Bible code came out during Second World War when they came out with code-breaking software. The rabbis throughout histories for centuries knew that in the scriptures... That there, were, that there were patterns hidden in there, but they would spend entire lifetimes just to break down one pattern and one code that was hidden in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So when they came out with code-breaking software and computers in World War II, a Jew thought, gee, what would happen if I take the Word of God, if I take the Old Testament, and I run it through, in the original Hebrew, through the code-breaking software, and what would happen? And they came up with the Bible code. That's where the Bible code came from. And it's not something to like foresee the future. It was one of these things where uh, you can put words in, look up things, and it'll go back and look up scriptures. And so they would find uncanny things like in the same portion of scripture would be Thomas Edison, his birthday, the day he died, um, electricity, and so on. They would find Princess died, the day she died, the city she died in, um, all of that in the same portion of scripture. And it was uncanny. Well... I bought the Bible code software way back when it, when it went on the, the discount rack for $9.99 at Best Buy. <laughs> and um, they make it seem like you don't need to know Hebrew when you do it, but you do. You need to know Hebrew. It does, you can't just 
you know, you could like say, well, you type, you can type in a word like dog or something like that, and it'll give you the Hebrew word. But you really kind of have to understand and know somewhat of the structure of the Hebrew, and I think that's why the Bible software didn't take off, <laughs> was because most people don't know Hebrew. So, in the process of running it through, I thought, gee, what will happen if I take my name, Chauncey Navarro, convert it into the Hebrew, and run it through the Bible code software? And I was a little surprised. Because I ran it through the entire Old Testament, and it showed up one time. One time! Translated not like <laughs> you have to, for the CH, you actually have to use the Saudi instead of a CH and stuff. But there, there's little things you have to understand in the structure of the Hebrew to know what you're doing on it. So it shows up one time. So I'm thinking, well, that's both my first and last name together. If I split it up, if I do Chauncey and I do Navarro, it'll probably show up all over the place. So I did just Chauncey and just Navarro separately. That was the same, only one place it showed up in all the scripture. Now, had it showed up two places on one of them, or three somewhere, or something like that, that, that would have, to me, that would have, uh, that would have made more sense. But for it to only show up one time, but it, the fact that it did show up one time, and that it showed up in the exact same place in scripture, both first and last name, to me seemed uncanny. My conclusion was. Let's face it, Chauncey's not a, Chauncey Navarro is not exactly a common name, right? My conclusion was that if this is the book of life, everybody's name is hidden in the Bible code that is saved. And it'll probably, and I, I wish I had thought it through a little more at the time, because I probably would have like put my birthday in, put different, because it's probably got more information than just the name. It probably has, you know, I mean, you've got how many John Smiths in the world, right? Yeah. So it probably has birth dates, it probably has the day they died, it probably it has down. significant events. Yeah, to narrow it down because, like you said, it's a common name. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you still have the software? Uh, I do, but it doesn't run in the window in the current Windows. It, it only ran in, I think it, back then, I think the last version it ran in was Windows XP. I have that at home. <laughs> so yeah, probably, yeah. I still have that old computer. You know, Chuck Missler's really good at that Bible code stuff. Yeah. He's got all, he's going to find all the names of the trees in Genesis. Yes, yes, that was Isn't really that cool. Yeah. Shall we move on? Let's move on. Romans 2.8, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek where there's no partiality in God. You know, i got to throw something in real quick. Notice how it says, to the Jew first and then to the Greek, right? Um, it tells you in chapter 14 of Revelation that the 144,000 that it mentions in chapter 7 are all from Israel, right? Now, if you look at it, they're the first, it says in chapter 14, they're the first fruits. First fruits had to be offered up before the harvest, yeah. right? Now, if you look at this where it says, first to the Jew, then the Gentile, the 144,000 of the first fruits, they get to be in the resurrection first, then the harvest has both Jew and Gentile as the one new man. Anyway, go on. Yeah. Are you calling Israel Jews? God did. I mean, is, but that's what you're referring to. Yes. When, when, when Paul called himself both an Israelite, a Jew, and a Benjamite. Yeah. yeah. So when you say you're talking about all the tribes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's what God did in Nehemiah and Ezra, where he called them Jews, and he called them the whole house of Israel. Yeah. Even though it was only 2%. Right. For as many as, as, many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Mm -hmm. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves. Which goes back to the second judgment, the second right. resurrection, the white right. judgment. Faith without works is dead. James. 
Amen. Yep. Romans 2.15 says, Who showed the work of the law, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else accusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus the Messiah, according to my good news. Now, if you look in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 32, he says, Behold, the days come, say the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Back to Romans on it. He says, Indeed, you were called Jew, and the rest and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. And are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, and a teacher of babes, having a form of knowledge and truth in the law. Now, if you look on this, who was the new covenant given to? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. So, whenever a goyim or a Gentile says, oh, well, I'm not an Israelite, I'm not a Jew. Do you really want to not be in the new covenant? Do you really want to rob yourselves of the blessings and the promises that were exclusively given to the house of Israel and exclusively given to the Jews? The new covenant is only for them. It's only for Israel and Judah. That's so it. if you were adopted in through Jesus, who is from the tribe of Judah, we've been made kings and priests through the line of Judah, through the line of Israel, by adoption. We are kings through the line of Judah because it's the kingly line. We are priests through the line of Jesus through Melchizedek. If you cut yourself off from Judah, you cut yourself off from Israel and say, I am not a Jew, I am not an Israelite, then guess what? Now, you're not in the new covenant. Now, you've cut yourself of the promises that God gave to Israel and Judah. That tree that we showed last week showed how we were grafted in. In fact, it, was, it would be arrogant for us to think that we could attain salvation without being grafted in. Can you guys go back to the Jeremiah script for a sec? I think this is the, this is the verse that a lot of these hyper-grace churches use to say that the law is gone because now it's on our hearts, so we right. don't have to obey. That makes sense? Mm. But the problem on it is, oh, one, these are the same people that are saying these laws that called God called a permanent statute forever, oh, that's for Israel. Wait, wait, I don't understand something. If a law is written in your heart, right. then that means you love to do it. Correct. Right. Okay, if it's written in your heart... Then you have a heart for the law. You have a heart for the law. Right. And that doesn't mean... it. Okay, you wrote the law there, and then that's it. I'm not doing it. That's what they said. Well, so, here's how they interpret it. And this is what I find fascinating. The way they interpret it is this. Well, since God wrote it on my heart, my heart will tell me what's right and wrong. Yeah, <laughs> The problem is, what does the Bible say about our hearts? Deceitful and wicked. Yes. Who should know what I, the Lord, searcheth the heart? It's going to lie to you. Yes. <laughs> it's going to lie to you. You can't go by what your heart tells you. Yeah. It has to be that His laws have been put on your heart. You have a heart for the laws. You love to do His laws because they give you life. All right. I, I, the way I see it, too, it is we have literally been reprogrammed. Yes. It's like He takes His Torah, yes. His law, and reprograms a microchip into our heart yes. and then we all of a sudden and it even says that we won't have to be taught per se mm -hmm. it will be programmed into our hearts and I believe that that's what salvation is all about is is when we receive God's law in our hearts and and, and the world thinks it's some you know it's some mystical thing but I believe it's really yeah. the, the word of God imprinted and programmed well, yes. into our hearts. I think the people that don't want to keep it it just hasn't been written in their heart yet. Well, I also find, too, that when you reject from God, you become desensitized. Uh, okay. You right. become leprosy spiritually. Yeah. Mm.
And so you have to understand, leprosy, when I was teaching on it, it is a desensitization. Right. And what does it come from? Malnutrition. Yeah, not being If you're not reading the laws, how are you going to love them? How are you going to know them? You're not even going to know what they are. You're not even going to know what they are. Is this mine? Yes, I do. I'm going to put it in here because it's not cold. Sure. <laughs> I want cold. And this was, uh, this scripture is yours coming up here. Indeed, you are called a Jew, and the rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. Being instructed out of the law. The law does not fix a heart. It does not fix a conscience. But what is it? It's the ruler, it's the measure that shows us what sin is. As Romans is going to tell us later on, how would we know what sin was except for the law? Guys, how much of this is coming well, not in my, only that, my but message? We can't, we, uh, we can't be in his <laughs> kingdom if we're not right. obeying the king. <laughs> well, he says, those that right. love me and kept my commandments. Over and over, he says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Those that love me and kept my commandments. And if you say you love me and don't keep them, you're a liar. You're a liar. Uh -huh. and, and, and the truth does not live in you. And who's the truth? <laughs> And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. How do we become an instructor? Through, through knowing the truth in the law. That, that even if we don't understand the law, we recognize that, hey, God said it, so we know it's right. And as Steve's always saying, a good understanding have all those that do his commandments. So if we practice to do them, God is going to bring understanding in that law just by trying to keep it. Yeah. A little question for you guys. What is a surefire way to upset God? What do you guys think? Let's read Romans Multiple choice. You therefore who teach each other, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. God hates being misrepresented. And God hates hypocrisy. Hates it. Practice what you preach. What are some other things God hates? I just thought I'd throw this in just for... The six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to Him. Yeah. You guys ever see this passage? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Mm. Romans 2.25 For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcisions become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So is this strictly a New Testament thing? Wow, that says it all, doesn't it? That's amazing. Deuteronomy 10, 16 to 18. He says, Circumcision, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. This is Deuteronomy. This is Old Testament. Yeah, it yeah. says, For the Lord your God is God of gods, and the Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty, and a terrible, which regards not persons, nor takes reward. 
He does execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Now, you look at that, this concept that Paul's talking about, he knew the law of the Old Testament. He was a lawyer. When Peter spoke and said that, you know, well, some of these sayings of Paul is difficult, the reason why was because unless you, you know, you take any fisherman today and put him with a lawyer, and you tell me if he understands what the lawyer is saying. Okay? Paul knew the law. He was thorough in the law. And so usually when he was writing these things, he's referring specifically to those laws, and he knew ever, all of his references came directly from the Old Testament. Yeah. Nothing that are written in these letters is new in the New Testament. Every single one of them was from the Torah. Right. And the Lord, your God, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Isn't that the first commandment? Yeah. And it was right in there about it takes the circumcision of heart. He wrote it in the Old Testament. He was telling them that, look, the same way a baptism does nothing in of itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a difference between a baptism and going swimming or, you know, taking a bath, right? You're immersing in water. It is what you're doing spiritually. Amen. It is what it represents and what it implies. And the circumcision of the flesh was the same thing. It was a significant outward expression of what God wanted inwardly. A cutting away of the flesh. Yes. Yes. I, I've read this book, the, the Autonomy, but I've never seen in the heart of your seed. That is, well, in, that is quite the... Uh, yeah, because he's cool. not just talking about you, he's talking about your offspring. That's right. And I mean, I if you stop that. and think about it, it isn't going to matter what kind of house you lived in. It's not going to matter what kind of car you drove. You know what's going to matter? How you raised your kids and how they raised those. That's your legacy in life. Right. Yes. That is the is second amazing. commandment, love your enemies? Um, is that, is that, your neighbor. Your neighbor. Is that also, in, back, is that also in Deuteronomy here. in the Old Testament? I'm sorry, what was it? The second commandment. Yeah. Like that's yes. An, yes. That's another they thing. Were both written, they were both written in Old Testament, both both that, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. That's both. another tragic thing that's going on today that I noticed from talking to the people is that they said, well, the, the law, like the Ten Commandments, and then there's now only two. I mean, that's just so there's tragic. Only two. Yeah. Oh, God. There were only two in the Old Testament. All ten of those fall under those two commandments. And all the laws of the old of the entire Torah fall under those ten. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going on, it says, And the Lord your God will put all these curses upon your enemies and upon those that hate you which persecute you. That's one of the blessings that God put to it, was that your enemies will now be the enemies of God. Galatians 5, 1 to 3, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Messiah has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, that if you become circumcised, Messiah will not profit, will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Now, next frame. It says, and I testify again that every man who becomes circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Is he saying if you keep one law, you have to keep all the laws? What is this pertaining to? Is he saying, you know, you better break all the laws? Because if you don't, if, if you keep one of them, if you don't murder somebody, let's keep that's a law, then you gotta keep all the laws? What is this pertaining to? What's he talking about? He's talking, no, he's talking about justification. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. In other yes. words, what he's saying is, look, if you are trying to be saved by keeping the law, you have to keep all the laws. You can't break one. Ever. In other words, that's the whole point. We are saved by grace through faith. People are trying to apply this to sanctification. You can't. No, to he didn't mean it like that. He's trying to tell them, you can't, you can't keep all the laws. No! He's telling them right here that, look, when he's saying, he's saying, if you break one law, you have to keep all of them. If you break, if you if you keep if you keep one law, you have to keep all of them. For, your for what? For, for your salvation. For justice. It's all. It's talking about salvation. It is not talking about sanctification. Right. Yes. Because otherwise, you would. Otherwise, we would all have to break every law. 
or keep, or keep, or keep all of them. Well, that's the point he's making, I think, is that you can't keep all of them. So if you're looking for your salvation to be that's based upon your ability to keep all the laws, that's you're not going to be able to do it. Right. That's right. it. That's and and that's the whole point. It that's is salvation that he's talking about. The it's, problem is the mainstream church is applying this to sanctification. Right, exactly. They're Not saying, oh, well, you know, you're a legalist if you say you have to keep the law because he's saying you keep one, you've got to keep them all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And saying, keep well, that's crazy then. Did you kill any? Did you murder anybody today? Did you commit adultery? Because you better, you better break them all. Well, why would Paul possibly <laughs> sanctify breaking? He wouldn't. What he's trying to say is, the people that try to earn their salvation through keeping the law will have to keep every single law. That's it. But That's you, earn, you, you, you earn your sanctification through keeping the heart of the law. Would that be correct? Well, you keep your sanctification is because yeah. you love the law, so you right. keep it now because we've been given salvation. Right. Yeah. Uh, one person did keep the whole law. Yes. He was saved by that. His Correct. name was Jesus. That's right. <laughs> And so, and that's the only one who did If that. through one man, right. sin would come, right. how much more through one righteous man, yeah. laying down his life, would salvation come? Yeah. And that's the whole point. If sin could come into the world through one man, then why couldn't salvation come into the world through one man? You have become estranged from Messiah. You have attempt, you attempt to be justified. Notice justified. That, what's right. that? Salvation. You attempt to be justified by law. You've fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Messiah Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And that's where the Spirit of the law encompasses that if you're doing, if you understand the Spirit of the law is understanding the intent of the lawgiver. What was the purpose of that law? The letter of the law brings death, but the spirit of that law brings life because the spirit of the law encompasses everything that was the intent of the lawgiver. That's good. That's a good For in Messiah, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. What was circumcision and why? What was circumcision? Setting a sign of a covenant. You're cutting away the flesh. What is it that we're worrying against that Paul's talking about through this whole thing? If you walk in the flesh, it will lead you to death. He says, mortify your flesh. Right? So we have a picture here of flesh getting cut away because if we walk in the Spirit, we will not feed the desires of the flesh. Okay. The flesh is like the ways of man, obviously. Yes. But we've got man versus spiritual. So right. You're going to walk in your flesh, which is your manly, mortal body, and everything you want to do. Well, obviously, that's not going to work. You have to work in the spirit. It, Jesus was telling the Pharisees the same thing. You want to keep the law, but you are not keeping the spirit of the law. If you lo if you commit adultery with a woman, you, you think if you don't, you're okay. But if you thought about it, you're not okay. Right. So he right there, he's also moving from the physical keeping the law to keeping the spirit of the law. So right. it's actually both. Well, and I think what God's, what he's doing, he's doing a rabbinical saying, when God said this, this was the intent of him. This is what he meant. Or, or Jesus be, is taking the Torah on to himself, and he is expanding the interpretation. Well, he is the Torah. Yes, he is. So I, I believe that wasn't. his interpretation of it was no different than what the Father's was. Him and the Father were one. He says, I tell you nothing that, that the Father didn't show me myself. So... He was giving the most accurate rabbinical you could possibly get by saying, when God said, thou shalt not steal, what he's really meaning is you should be a giver. When he said, thou shalt not murder, when you use when I say, uh, character assassination, you're guilty of murder. Yeah. When, when, when you've lusted after a woman in your heart, right, you're committing adultery in the aspect that, look, God is trying to give you a clean conscience. You're making it dirty. So he's giving them, what he's giving is he's basically taking it to the point of this was the intent of the law. He was saying this law could identify sin, but it couldn't clean your conscience. It couldn't make you clean. It was only through the Spirit of God that you could actually walk in the law of God. 
Is covetousness the spiritual part of the actual physical stealing then? It's wanting something and taking something that isn't yours or... Yeah. Well, covetousness is or, the spirit of actually stealing and stealing is that... It's intent. intent. What, what, what Steve was just teaching yesterday on this was the intent of the law. There's a difference when you are brought to court, right? When you accidentally injured somebody or accidentally killed somebody or you premeditated. You had you intentionally, you thought out, when, when you thought out what you were going to do ahead of time and it wasn't just an act of emotion, there was a high, higher level of guilt. And when we were going through Leviticus on the law, it was showing that you had the sin offering was an accidental. The guilt offering covered accidental and intentional. That there was intent to commit the sin. And that is coveting. And it, Paul goes in and he says, how would we know what sin was except the law told us? He says, we wouldn't have known that it was sin unless it said, thou shalt not covet. You don't accidentally steal something. I mean, like, That's what I mean. In other words, to me, I still look at it. I look at my children. and Because I always think of me with my kids the way God is with us. And I look at it and, you know, it starts out with, oh, Caleb has this. I don't want one. If you, how come I don't have what Caleb has? It starts with that. That's where it starts. Now, in essence, that's not really the issue yet. The problem is, if it stayed there, that would be one thing. It never stays there. Next thing you know, Jacob's got Caleb's head slamming it into a concrete floor. Where did that come from? It came because he had something that he wanted. If you look at it, that's why it talks about hate it leads to murder. It starts with hate. It's a seed. When it grows, the fruition of that is murder. And it's in the heart. Yeah, it's and it's in the heart. All of these things start as a seed. If you let that seed grow, it's going to get so big you can't pull the roots out. It starts as a thought. And it starts as a thought and it grows and it becomes something bigger than you can deal with. And that's the reason why the intent... The intent and the spirit is 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 everything. Mm -hmm. That's why Paul says here that if you become circumcised, the sign will profit you nothing. The cutting away of the flesh in the physical realm is not what God's after. He's after the circumcision of the heart. Amen. That's why he tells us to capture every thought. <laughs> yes. He goes on to say, you have become estranged from Messiah, you who attempt to be justified by law. I think I already covered this. Yeah, no, he's, he was back. Yeah. yeah. For, he just did that one too. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this is the final sign. Um, exactly. Is a believer saved by grace through faith? Yes. 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 Justified. Okay. Now, keep a hold of that. But true faith is not real without works, right? Correct. Yes. Is that correct? All right. Is it possible to please God without faith? No. no. All right. So... Is it possible to please God without works? No. Because no. 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 faith and works. Right. 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 And this is why I think so many times, again, the hyper-grace mainstream church, they don't understand. Like Chauncey's saying, there's a difference between justification and sanctification. Yeah. Justification is all by grace. Through and faith. Through faith. And even that not of yourselves. It's a gift, a free gift. But that doesn't say anything about sanctification. Sanctification is all about works. It's all about works to please God. To please God. Exactly. And well, the whole intent is to please God. Go ahead. Well, uh, for me, uh, when you do works, it's actually an e the evidence that you have the faith. True. Because right. if you don't have the faith, you're not going to do the works. You, you, no. Yeah. So it's just, it's natural. It just comes out. Right. You could like, empty works. Yeah. Well, works because you love. All of a sudden, you learn to do the will of God. Well, works in that sense, Danny, it's a good point. Really, works. Uh, it has a dual purpose. Works is evidence of your salvation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but works is also your sanctification towards you being glorified in heaven. Right. So the more you do the deeds unto the Lord that we do, we are being glorified in heaven for that. We are accumulating our crowns of glory in heaven. And that's why he said, put your treasures in heaven, exactly. where that's rust right. cannot eat away with it, the moth can't eat it up. Because if we're putting our treasures in heaven, and we're shooting for those goals, we're not going to be looking at the carnal and the physical here. We're going to be looking for the eternal glories that we're going to be able to keep. 
Is that a, I mean, it, it seems so simple though, right? But it, it, a lot, I think 90% of Christian, uh, Christendom doesn't really understand the difference between sanctification no. and justification. justification. Yeah. Well, yeah. they're not being taught. They're not being taught. The teachers, either they don't know or they're just not right. teaching it. Well, in, uh, sometimes if you look at it like this, like Peter said, you know, he, he backed up what Peter said, but then he said, you know, he, these are hard things to understand. Well, if you're not a lawyer, and it's written and it's a law, then yeah, it's probably hard to understand. But if you are taking those laws, if you've got these laws, you know these laws, and then you parallel the laws with what he's saying, they make a lot of sense. Uh, we could close in prayer, that way whoever needs to go can take off. And it will take questions, answers, discussions, whatever. Greg, you want to close? <laughs> Lord, thank you for this college education. You're so cheap. <laughs> Lord, these are, are lessons in life that we all need to hear. We need to all apply. And, and I just thank you for these great teachers that are, are putting out their knowledge, their experiences, and sharing yes, them with Lord. us and so we can understand more fully. Lord, I just thank you for all the people here. I ask a blessing on them. And Lord, open up our minds, open up our hearts, let us receive this message and apply it. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Any questions? Love, I love hearing you guys' comments. feedback. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if somebody, you know how some people only accept the Lord in their dying moment. Mm -hmm. Right. So. I think I was going to ask this earlier and I'm glad I didn't get this what you kept saying when you kept explaining it kind of gave me an answer. It seems to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that that person who accepted God yeah. or Jesus in their dying moment yeah. is justified, yes. but are they not necessarily sanctified because they may yes. have been a In other words, life. they got the seed of salvation, but now when they go before God who is an all-consuming fire, they didn't develop any of the life of Christ. Jesus. That's why Daniel tells you in the resurrection where he says your dead shall live, some to everlasting glory, some to everlasting contempt. It says that in Daniel. Remember Jesus did say this day you will be with me in paradise. So he is going to be saved. He'll be justified. I just believe but he didn't have much time to accumulate any. Yeah, he, how much of the life of Christ did he develop on the cross? Yeah. He'll be picking up the dog poop. <laughs> well, a lot better than being in uh, t torment. Yeah, he's going to be there. He didn't have yeah. any of the life in Christ. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. You got his salvation. You got his door. Again, going back to what's yeah. required, faith, faith alone it begins it. Yeah. He, he did that faith, had no time to go out and do any good deeds at all. Right. That's why I tell people heaven is not a level playing field. Yeah. No. You know, it, some people will just get in the door. They'll get their sub. They'll have their salvation. But if they lived carnal lives, how much of the life of Christ did they develop to take with them through eternity? Right. You know, and I think that's where there's going to be a lot of regret when, because right now the thing we're battling with is this flesh. Right. Right. We got a new heart. We got a new mind according to Scripture. But we're still battling the old flesh. So when we get the new flesh, the battle's over. But. Where we're at at that time is where we're going through eternity. So the person that lived a carnal life and said, well, I got my fire insurance. They got their fire insurance. That's all they got. That's what they're going through eternity with, their fire insurance. There'll be a dim light. Yeah. Hmm. Well, what is that verse that tells about the, the brightness of the firmament? Uh, Daniel chapter 12, 1 down to verse 7, I think. Okay. Daniel chapter 12. 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the whole beginning of Daniel, he talks, he goes in and he says, at this time Michael will stand up. And then he says, he talks about the resurrection, he says, your dead shall live. He says, some to everlasting glory, some to everlasting contempt. Then he clarifies that statement by saying, those that top many will shine like the stars of the firmament. Right? And so he's going on to say that basically the difference between... The ones that go to everlasting glory and the ones that go to everlasting contempt. The contempt is that they didn't do anything with their mind up. That, that, that the talents that God gave them, they didn't do anything with. They didn't, 
They didn't develop the life of Christ to go through eternity. That's scary. If it is scary. It All is right. scary. I'm, I'm going to throw this out for you guys. One takeaway. I want to hear what you guys individually would look as a takeaway for uh, what we covered today. Oh, what are you going to take away from here when you leave? Yeah. What's 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 one point that you think uh, shines through? That we need to take away from this meeting. That faith without works is dead. What's that? Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. The distinction between justification and sanctification. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, how you measure uh, judge um, judge others is how you'll be judged. Ooh, that's good. Mm -hmm. You guys heard that right? <clears throat> the importance of judging one another. I mean, not judging one another. Not judging the importance another. of receiving forgiveness. Receiving forgiveness. He's well, he's well, not a, a fearing reward over men and his traditions. Mm -hmm. Shows you they're all listening. Yeah, yeah. Well, well you know, and, and see, this is what we really want. You know, when I do my Tuesday night Bible studies, I'm kind of whizzing through them at a pretty good rate. <laughs> we get some interaction and some feedback, which is good. But what I wanted with me and Lucky here, which is what I'm, I'm seeing, and this is the whole point to it, is, is we wanted to go a little bit slower, take a little more time, dig a little deeper, and kind of get more interaction and feedback from you guys in terms of, you know, what we're digging into here. What's coming out of the scriptures. I love how you guys are showing, um, you know, the Torah and the New, Te like the New Testament, which I think is basically commentary of the Old Testament. Connect the dots. Yeah, how you're putting that together. Well, like you said, there was no New Testament when Paul was yeah. preaching right. and teaching. And so all scripture was in the Old Testament was Torah. Mm -hmm. at, one, at one point, I was in a Bible study. And I opened up my Bible and I told people, I said, I'm going to tear out all the pages that don't belong here. And so I opened up my Bible and I went to the page between the New Testament and the Old Testament and I ripped it out. And it's still missing to this day. And that's the only page that really doesn't belong here. Right. You know, and, and if you really understand, there's no, there shouldn't be a separation and a division between Old and New Testament. Was the New Testament ever... Uh, scribed in Hebrew, or was it always in, in originally? In, well, in first Hebrew? of all, the Magdalene scrolls back up the fact that that Matthew, who was a tax collector, knew shorthand, wrote it in shorthand Aramaic, Aramaic, and which was a derivative of Hebrew. In other words, it was it's a just a belt tense difference. Because some people make this, they're like, well, you know, if it's canon and it's the word of God, and he, you know, he allowed it to be written in Greek. We should, we should know Greek. You know, we should know Greek over Hebrew. You know, like you know, I started the Greek the same time I started Hebrew. Yeah. The first day, I left the Greek, and I mean, I do word studies. That's it. It was Greek to me. It was totally Greek to me. And the Hebrew, I, I, I love the Hebrew. I always tell people Hebrew changed my life. Yeah. But the Greek, I'll do Greek word studies, and that's as far as I go. And it, Greek is... It, it's all Greek to you? Yeah, it's all Greek to me. It, it, Greek is difficult. It is. It's, it, I, it is. It's very difficult. I found the Hebrew a lot more enlightening, and it was easier for me to learn. You know? But I have a Hebrew manuscript, or a copy of a Hebrew manuscript of the first couple of chapters of the Revelation of Jesus in Hebrew. And it was apparently and obviously not copied from the Greek, meaning there had to be an original Hebrew at some point. That it came from, from the from the uh, museum of uh, library of uh, London, yeah, from the 14th century, and you can tell it wasn't copied from the Greek because of the way they translated the words. If it had been translated from the Greek, they wouldn't have used the word Yeshua. They wouldn't have used the word Yahashua. And so you see definite, obvious, you know, things that I expected to see because I've always been suspicious that the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew. You've got to think, Paul was a Jew and a lawyer, and everything was done in the synagogues. If it had to pertain to God, it was done in Hebrew. In the synagogues, everything was done in Hebrew. So, to think that he would, that everything from the New Testament would be written in Greek, even though it was the language of the day, is kind of crazy. Especially when you're using Jewish idioms in Greek that don't mean anything and in especially Greek. Especially the literature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that would be in Greek, right? Well, well, yeah. I mean, you know, why would you write to the Hebrews in Greek? Right? Right. 
But, but you know what? God, I, I think that I really believe the Greek New Testament ties into my, my life scripture that it's a marvelous thing for God to conceal a matter, but for kings to seek it out. And he says, you know what? He says, they, they, don't, they don't understand because they're dull of seeing and they're dull of hearing. And so he says, I speak in parables that you might understand, but that they would be confounded. Because they don't have the right heart. And he wants his people to understand. He doesn't want the enemies to understand. Do you think that that's a good witness? If, if, if this large, we call them hyper-grace churches, are not getting it, it's because it's an outward sign that their hearts are not in the right place. I think, I think actually what's happened in the time, the last century, the, accusation that yeah, was, the last that's century or so, it's been a brainwashing by a lot of um, pastors that either intentionally or unintentionally have been teaching the wrong But if you have that heart, like, you know, someone like you, was, you know, you've only been two yeah. years, like, how does it, how do I, how do I, it can't be me, how do I know, like, that that's, does it sound right? I don't know, how does that happen? You, you know what my litmus test is, what I look at on it, it is, because I, I, I look at it from the perspective on there that, oh gosh, I had it, I had it, I lost it. <laughs> yeah, because I, you, when you were, wait, backtrack what you were saying. What was the litmus test? Um, that if they can't, if they, if they can't understand, you know, uh, these points about the law and the spirit of the law, and they want to cut, you know, things off, mm -hmm. and they think that oh, the New Testament and the Old Testament. Thank you. My litmus test is this: God basically said that. Mm -hmm. um, my, my litmus test is God basically said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll heal their land. Is our, is our land being healed or are we on a fast track downward? See, to me, that's, that's the litmus test for the church. That's the litmus test for the body. Is if we as a church were where we were supposed to be, We'd be turning the country around. But even though there's a small remnant, it only takes a the size of a mustard seed of faith to move mountains. Couldn't the remnant do it? Yes. Yes. But and that's where it gets back to this yeah. whole thing where I keep saying, look, this has to be a mirror. When we change our lives, all the people we touch, their lives are going to get changed, and it's going to make a domino effect. It's going to spread. But it starts here. You can only, you can't change other people, you can only change yourself. So when you start here, you become a light to other people, and then that affects their lives, it causes them to be a light to other people, and it will spread. And, and, and a really, really neat, hopeful thing that we're seeing here is we have, you know, 20, so on, 20 people here today that are all, I think, on fire for what we're talking about. Yeah. And then we go out and become those little embers that catch the rest of the world on fire. But that's the way, isn't that the way all of the uh, revivals have started with just a handful of people, a remnant like you said, Christian. And I, I think we could be that remnant that starts that. But, but we really need to go out and, and shine the light, let the God's light shine. Go past these doors. Because I've got, I've only got maybe a couple of people from Reliance that I've talked to and a, a few other people, handfuls, that are actually starting to get it. Right, Greg? I mean, some of these guys are starting to get it. But it's only a handful of people. But if each one of us does two or three or four people in our lives... And then they do two or three people. Yeah, I mean, that's how And then how they do two or three, four people. And so on. And, and so, so on and so on. Exactly. Exactly. It, it has to start... when you, If you're going to really look... Like, even at the country. How do you change the country? One family at a time. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. But our hearts have to be... We have to guard our hearts and pray so diligently yep. to make sure we stay within a servant's heart and don't cross that line into that self-serving heart, which is, you know, heart it, prayers to me are, he's got those on me constantly to pray for people to have a servant's heart, myself personally. Well, you know, Christian, it's funny you mention it because I was going to throw my takeaway in there, and mine is to esteem others higher than ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's a struggle I have. We talk a lot about mentoring and mentees. And exactly. We, as mentors. And yeah. We were supposed to be serving the mentees, not exactly. feeling like, oh, oh, 
Oh, that's so nice yeah. that they want exactly. to mention that. And knowledge puffs up. And it seems like it's harder the more I get to learn and study the Bible. I have to admit that it's, it's tougher to not get puffed up. Totally. I, used to, I used to love to just recite scriptures to people like, you know, I really memorize. Mm -hmm. I pretty much memorized most of the Bible. It's a <laughs> horrible attitude because I knew that my spirit wasn't right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that that's the biggest challenge for a lot of guys is we, we have a tendency to want to be the mentors and the teachers and all that. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten to a point now where I'm afraid of myself. I am because I just, I know where my heart can go. And I think that's that's why that's my favorite takeaway is mm -hmm. esteem others higher than yourself mm -hmm. because yeah. inherently in my culture, with my family, with my dad, that's not the way we were mm -hmm. brought up. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, and if you look at where Paul talks about the lust of the eye, well, no, it's actually John talks about the lust, of the, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Yeah. The pride of life is the biggest root. The lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, lust and greed, are stems off of self. Everything stems off of self. So the big root, the big root that is always going to be our Achilles heel, is going to be self. Right. It's always going to be the biggest one. Pride is always going to be the biggest thing that we have to deal with because we are the biggest obstacle between us and what God wants for us. The enemy can really use you when you have pride too. Like I read somewhere, it was really interesting. I hope I don't butcher it, but that the demons know the law. Right. They know the law very well. And so as soon as we step spiritually outside the law in our hearts or in our minds, they're waiting with our flesh to grab hold and go. That's, that's run, a really run great it. point. But they're actually like, I think they were referred to as like the dark attorneys or yeah. something like that. Like they know the law. Well, you know, it's a great point. Because what is, what, what is, who's the teacher of the demons? The devil, right? Yeah. What is one of his titles? The accuser, the accuser of the brethren. Yeah. And they will, the more we know the law, the oh. more the devil and his demons mm -hmm. are going, hey, you yeah. really screwed up there. Yeah. You're a heathen. You're no good for nothing. And that's why I covered that point earlier about why I think that a, heart after God, a man after God's own heart is somebody who has learned to trust in God. Because the minute you get to that level where you don't hear their voice or, or where the demon's voices become just slide off your shoulder, that's the point where you can really do God's work because you're you're immune to the accusations of the enemy. The enemy is going to keep wanting to drag you down and saying you're worthless and he's right. We are worthless without Christ. Yeah. But that's the whole thing and uh, where Christ comes together with the law is that truth. Once we grasp hold of the whole truth, nothing the enemy or his demons. <laughs>